So here we are. Let me just get, get my act together here. Okay, here we have it. Here comes the sun. Not, not much sign of it today, um, as you can see. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about, the effect about, about sunshine and why it's important, you know, why, why that it's good for us, bad for us, neutral for us, and what it, what it, basically what it's all about. Okay, and of course the title comes from uh, George Harrison's song, Here Comes the Sun, which he, 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 he himself uh, says in his writings, he wrote it because he was feeling very depressed at the end of the winter. Um, so, you know, if anybody's got a, a tune going through their minds at the moment, it's time to write it down. Okay, well, so the, there is a science of sunlight, and there's a science, in many ways, a science of sunlight. In fact, in some ways, the whole of biology is the science of sunlight, because without the sun, we wouldn't have life on Earth. And I'm interested in that because I'm concerned with the flow of energy through ecological systems, but I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to talk about, I suppose we might call it the science of the sun. Here comes the sun, the sun newspaper, that is. <laughs> and the sun newspaper has worked out the most depressing day of the year using this uh, rather baffling formula, which I can't, I can't make, make any sense of, whatever I try. Um, but uh, anyway, they put it to the sun's computers, or at least their hand calculator, and they work out that the most depressing day of the year is Jan was, or this year, it was January the 15th, was, uh, which was a week last Monday, okay? And that's based on how depressed you feel because you haven't kept your New Year's resolutions, how much you are in debt, how little sunlight there is, and so we've got a good, solid day to feel really depressed on, okay? Um, so that's certainly true, and they call it Blue Monday. Um, however, this is the uh, Met Office projection for today, and I think it's bloody worse, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay. So it's, it's Deep Blue Monday today. But there is hope, there is hope, because at the other end of the planet, if we go to the Daily Mail, another excellent source of unbiased view, um, um, uh, this is the Daily Mail's headline a couple of days ago, in Sydney, get set for a scorcher. Record heat wave with temperatures soaring to 43. So how hot is it going to be near you? And you can look it up on the Daily Mail's website, and the answer is hot, OK? And 43 is hot. I've been in Sydney when it's been 43, and it's really quite oppressive. But so um, the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We, we like to think, of course, um, that having extremely hot weather, in that we don't experience it very, very much, um, is, generally speaking, a good thing. However, the culture in, in Sydney, and indeed in many parts of the tropical world, is exactly the opposite. They're concerned about hot weather um, on the grounds of health. Um, particularly they're uh, concerned about the effects of ultraviolet light on skin cancer, which is certainly true. And this is Sid the Seagull, okay? And Sid the Seagull says, slip on a shirt, slop on some sunscreen, and slap on a hat, all right? Um, and in fact, there have been cases in, uh, in Australia of children who have uh, a shortage of vitamins in their blood because they do that so often that they don't get any tan at all. Um, if you put factor 20 all over yourself, you're not going to get any sunlight into your skin. Now, the reason, of course, that they're concerned about that has to do with skin cancer. And it's certainly the case, it's certainly the case, that there is a fit between ultraviolet light and skin cancer. And you see that in many ways. One of the most telling bits of information, perhaps, is that if you live in a hot country and you drive around, you tend to, I remember it well, hang your arm out of the window when you're driving, okay? And because uh, in Australia they drive on the left, so they have right-arm drive cars, um, and they stick their right arm out of the window, and it's in America they drive on the right, they stick their left arm out of the window, there is a highly significant difference in the incidence of skin cancers on left arms and right arms in Australia and the United States. Okay, shows the inferential method in scientific discovery. <laughs> um, and it's certainly true. It's certainly true. And in fact, all this fuss about skin cancer in Australia isn't doing all that much good. Here's the incidence of melanoma, Melanoma, and that's the dangerous skin cancer, which can certainly kill. It's not particularly common, but it can certainly kill. And in spite of all the, um, in spite of all the propaganda and all the information, everybody in Australia knows about this, um, the incidence is still going up. 
Okay, so it's a dangerous. It's a, it's certainly a dangerous disease. But you notice in Australia, which is really quite a bit, uh, quite a populous country, several tens of millions of people, you will see that the uh, deaths per year are around 1,000, 1,500, which is bad news if you're in those statistics. But is a rather low death rate. Uh, and you'll see on the right, this is a non-malignant um, uh, cancers, which don't go, don't don't get malignant, but they're, they're simply related to it. Well, this effect of of, um, of uh, sunlight on skin cancer was in fact discovered in the 1930s by a huge survey done by the United States Navy. And the United States Navy was con concerned about the health of its, uh, of its sailors in relation to the general population. So they did this big and well-planned survey of life and death and disease incidents in the in Navy personnel, and they found indeed that there was an increase in skin cancer among sailors compared to people who worked on land. And sailors, of course, are generally much more exposed to the sun than people who work in offices and so on on land. And that became very well established and is true, I don't deny it. Okay. However, what was also established by that um, discovery was in fact that if you looked at other cancers in the United States sailors, they had fewer cancers than average. And that's, was, that's been forgotten. It's not been forgotten, but it certainly hasn't, uh, it hasn't, um, it hasn't reached the public, the public um, uh, mind. So what's the public know about skin, uh, ultraviolet light is that it's bad for you. And if you look at what the experts say, Cancer Research UK said how, how the sun and UV cause cancer. Ultra, the American Cancer Society writes about UV radiation, the dangers of um, skin cancer, skin cancer facts, skincancer.org. Okay, that's all right. Uh, and what they're basically telling us is that sunlight is dangerous. Well, sunlight is dangerous in some ways. But what they should be telling us, they should, on balance, it's really good for you, okay? <laughs> and where you get the, st the, uh, the, uh, the story really comes to a, to a uh, peak in, when you look at the health and the weather in Scotland. And I have to say that you soft southerners don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> I spent 10 years in Edinburgh. Take it from me, it's a wonderful place apart from the weather, all right? I sometimes used to say, apart from the weather and the Scots, but I stopped saying that. Um, I, could, I could say the weather and the Scots nationalists, maybe. Um, so, uh, and uh, it is a wonderful place apart from the weather. Billy Connolly put it very well. He said, There are two seasons in Scotland June and winter. And he, and he was right, okay? Um, well, in fact, Somebody uh, died long before, uh, somebody who died long ago, and is even more well known than Billy Colony, wrote about that. And this is R.L. Stevenson, and he wrote a piece about the weather in Edinburgh. The weather is raw and boisterous in winter, shifty and ungenial in summer, and a downright meteorological purgatory in the spring. <laughs> Happy the passengers who shake off the dust of Edinburgh and have heard for the last time the cry of the east wind among her chimney tops. And that brings back memories, I can tell you. <laughs> I can hear the cry of the east wind now. And of course, he left, it, he left Edinburgh when he was a fairly young man, and he moved first to California and then to Samoa, where he died of tuberculosis. Okay? And we'll come back to that tuberculosis question a little bit later in the talk. And Edinburgh has really quite a unique, Edinburgh and Scotland in general, has really quite a, a unique set of, um, of uh, climatic challenges. For example, Edinburgh, this is an Edinburgh, typical Edinburgh summer's day. Uh, <laughs> this is what we call the HAAR, H-A-A-R. And when I first went there in 1962, a long time ago, um, I kept waiting for spring to arrive. Um, and the only thing that happened to spring didn't arrive was that the days got longer and then after a while they started getting shorter again <laughs> and that's because um, that's because there was no, no real change in temperature that's because very often in Edinburgh you have this sea mist that comes in off the North Sea and condenses um, uh, 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 in, on, on the land and gives you this often a day long a more than day long uh, thick for, uh, thick fog which keeps the sun out. But Edinburgh has also a, rather, a very unique position um, because there are very few places in the world um, which have large populations as far north as that. These are places with more than 25,000 people at the latitude of Scotland or higher. And you'll see Edinburgh and Glasgow there. There are a few places, uh, Stock Stockholm for example, Murmansk, but very few. And in fact only about 2% of the world's population lives north of Edinburgh and Glasgow. And in fact only about 1% of the world's population lives north of the Shetland Isles. 
So, um, you know, they're really fairly unique in their position. It's also the case that Edinburgh, and Glasgow more than Edinburgh, has, uh, has the, the joys of the Gulf Stream, which brings in even more cloud, okay? Well, Edinburgh's position means that it gets less sunshine because when the sun comes in to a uh, northern part of the world or a southern part of the world, then it has to pass through more of the atmosphere so it's attenuated more um, as it comes through. The sun is never directly above you that far north, but it is, of course it is directly above you in the, in, in the equation. And there's a... Um, uh, if you look at Europe, you'll see that the effect, again, is very strong. There's uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh um, France. I have, as it happens, I spend three months a year here, <laughs> and I'm going down in a couple of weeks, except it will, be, except it will be, still be pretty cold down there. So they're pretty exceptional places. Um, you can see it even on the scale of Britain. Okay, or you, this is the amount of ultraviolet that gets through the, through the atmosphere um, uh, in Edinburgh over the year, in London over the year, and in, uh, in uh, Bordeaux over the year, and they're really quite striking differences. Even on the scale of Britain, you have a striking difference in the number of hours of bright sunshine from place to place. Now, that's uh, an interesting figure, an interesting picture. In Scotland, in northern Scotland, you have fewer than 1,600 hours of bright sunshine uh, most years. In, 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 southern, in south, sorry, fewer than 900 hours of bright, bright sunshine in most years. In southern England, you have almost twice that, and in southern Europe you have well over twice that. Okay. Now if you look, if you fix that, um, that diagram in your mind and look at the next one, these are male life expectancy at birth um, in, in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And you'll see a fairly striking fit, I think, with the number of hours of bright sunshine. Okay? And that's been known for a long time. Now Scotland, in fact, um, has um, a famously low life expectancy, particularly Western Scotland. This blob is known as Glasgow, all right? And, uh, and, and Glasgow has a uniquely low life expectancy, both in Britain and indeed in most of, in, in most of Europe, okay? But Scotland as a whole doesn't do all that well. This is the male life expectancy at birth in different places. Uh, if, on the left, you see a place called Colton, Okay, where male life expectancy is about only, on the average, only about 54 years. Um, and Colton is, is in inner Glasgow. And we'll go through and we'll see, we go to India, Colton life expectancy on the average is lower than that of Indian men. We go all the way through to the average of the UK for men, 77. And then we've got to go to the right, and there's a place called Lindsay. And Lindsay is an outer Glasgow suburb, um, five miles from Colton. Um, Britain and Somalia, have a 28-year difference in male life expectancy. Lindsay and Colton have a 28-year difference in life expectancy. So over five miles, we've got 28-year difference in life expectancy. Um, now, this has always historically been thought, and no doubt, no doubt, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, um, um, some some truth in this. In Lindsay, which is tremendously deprived, people have a very poor diet, there's quite a lot of violence, huge amounts of heavy drinking, very poor housing. Now this certainly plays a part, there's no question. But I think the answer, to understand it, understand need, needs a lot more than those rather obvious threats to health. Scotland is the sick man of Europe and is becoming increasingly so. This is male life expectancy, oh, sorry, this is average male and female life expectancy from the 1950s to 2010. Scotland is the, is the, is the red line. And you'll see that Scotland has consistently been lagging behind um, the, rest, the rest of Europe and is now has the lowest life expectancy in, in Europe. Um, and in fact, the situation, uh, and it's, it's rapidly been overtaken by being overtaken by Eastern Europe, places like Romania, Bulgaria and the like, at the present rate, they will overtake Scotland within the next three or four years and the, in life expectancy. So the, the situation is not getting better, it's actually getting worse. Here we have uh, life expectancy uh, for uh, at the age of 85, so that's elderly people in Scotland. Um, and um, you'll see that, it's, strangely enough, about the time of the election in 2010, by remarkable coincidence, 
the increase, the, the improvement in life expectancy um, in, in elderly Scots came to a complete stop, as indeed it has throughout England, England Wales, and Scotland. Um, but it, it, it's actually got much, it's got considerably worse. The gap has got bigger uh, from 2010 to 2015. So things are not looking particularly good. And um, I remember I went to a conference a few weeks ago in Edinburgh where um, uh, about... Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, not something I know anything about, but apparently I had to talk about it. And the Glasgow doctor uh, quoted some differences he'd noticed in the attitude towards mortality um, in, uh, in different parts of the world. He says, well, he said, well, he said, in San Francisco, death is avoidable. In London, death is inevitable. And in Glasgow, death is imminent. <laughs> <laughs> He said that with real relish as a Glasgow doctor. Um, and it's, as you can see from those figures, that's certainly true. And if you look at the, some of the particular causes of death, um, Scotland is worse than England for MS, cancer, heart disease, rickets, infectious disease, birth defects, depression, suicide, and more. And the effects aren't small. The effects are really quite big. Um, for example, if you look at the suicide rates, um, in Scotland and England. Uh, let's look at men who are much more likely to commit suicide. You'll see that the, uh, that the, the, uh, the Scottish rate, the pale blue line, is almost twice the English rate. Okay. Um, whoops, whoops, whoops. Missing a slide there. What happened there? Okay. Um, all right. And the same is true for things like heart disease. So the effects are big. So one needs to ask, why is that? Well, we have a fairly... A fairly, uh, a fairly um, uh, uh, clear idea why it is, it has to do with vitamin deficiency. It has to do in particular with vitamin D deficiency. And I'll talk at some length about that in a moment. But vitamin D is, isn't really a vitamin at all. Um, vitamin D is in fact a hormone. It's made in the skin, it's made in large amounts of, in the skin when sunlight strikes a relative of cholesterol and it makes a precursor which then moves to the kidneys and the liver and is turned into the stuff vitamin D. Okay. Um, and you can get it from your food, you can get it from fresh fish, <coughs> you can get it from a pill if you want to, um, you get it from, uh, from uh, from fortified foods, which we don't have many of in Britain, they do in the United States, um, but overwhelmingly you get it from sunlight. You know? If you expose your whole body for 20 minutes to bright sunlight, you'll get 10,000 units of vitamin D, which would involve eating about, um, about um, 25 uh, uh, helpings of fresh salmon, which you probably wouldn't particularly succeed in holding down, I don't think. So, sun, so sunlight is an extraordinarily powerful um, source of vitamin D. So we need to ask, what are the patterns of sunlight across the world, and what are the patterns of vitamin D uh, presence, and what, if anything, do these do to human health? Well, this is a map that shows the ability of white people to synthesize vitamin D um, in different parts of the world in relation to latitude. And you'll see in the yellow zone, uh, which basically is the tropics, or a bit outside the tropics, um, uh, people can synthesize vitamin D all year round. Okay? In the pale yellow zone, um, you can, there's at least one month a year, and often more than one month a year, where you cannot synthesize vitamin D for enough. And if you draw a line through Birmingham, and many people that wish to draw a line through Birmingham, <laughs> um, north of that line, uh, you can never synthesize enough, uh, enough um, vitamin D uh, to stay healthy. Okay? The, 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 amount of the, 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 the black marks are just population density. So the people who live north of Birmingham, let alone north of Glasgow, can find it, would find it extremely difficult or, or impossible to, um, to um, synthesize enough vitamin D to, uh, to uh, stay healthy. Um, now, you can see that as we move down through Europe, this is the amount of ultraviolet light um, um, you have and whether you, can, whether you can or cannot make vitamin D. You'll see on the left there, which is the, the island of Skye, um, any, any month which is dark blue or pale blue, you can't make vitamin D. In, uh, in Skye and Edinburgh, you can't make vitamin D for something like eight months of the year. As you go south to to London, that you gain, uh, you gain something from that, but as you go further south to Marrakesh, things change completely. So the effect is really quite big. Um, this is the patterns of vitamin D deficiency in different parts of Britain at different seasons of the year. 
And of course, in the winter, there's almost no sunlight. And you'll see if you, the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, proportion deficient is shown by the colors from uh, the pale uh, brown at the left, with very few deficient, to dark green at the right, where very many are deficient. And you'll see consistently that Scotland has lower levels of vitamin D on average than the rest of the UK, but no doubt largely because of the weather. Okay, so we need we need to take that on board. So vitamin D levels are low in Scotland and have been for a long time. Now, you notice I said I was talking about white people uh, making vitamin D because people with dark skins, either of Asian origin or of African or of African origin, are much less able to make make vitamin D than people with light skins uh, for obvious reasons. They have melanin pigment in their skin, which keeps the ultraviolet light out. And indeed, it is very much the case that uh, uh, sunlight related diseases are much more common in Britain, for example, among people of Afro-Caribbean origin or among people of Indian origin than people of European origin. So this is, uh, what, so why did this happen? Well, in fact, the light skins of Europeans evolved in response to a shortage of sunlight. Because as we moved out of Africa, something like 80,000 years ago, and began to move across Europe, quite recently the move across Europe, it really didn't get to Western Europe in any numbers until about five or 6,000 years ago. We began, individuals who had relatively light skin, as they moved into the cloudy horrors of the north, tended to survive rather better than individuals with dark skin. So they reproduced more effectively, and so the light skin genes became more common. Um, and this is rather a baffling slide, but I'll show it to you because it's a, a remarkable finding. This is human fossil DNA. And you can now, of course, get fossil DNA, uh, not just out of recent humans. These are, these are 5,000 years old uh, from the Ukraine. And these are genes which tend to make your skin lighter. And what we've got, we won't bother you with the boring names of them, but 5,000 years ago, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, if we... We can see, uh, if we look in Africa today, none of these genes are present. There are none of, the, none of these skin lightening variants present in African populations. If we look in the modern Ukraine, there are 65% of Ukrainians nowadays have uh, the light version of the first one, 92% of the second one, and 36% of the third one. But if we look at Ukraine 5,000 years ago, we'll see that, let me, let's take, for example, the one um, the, the third one, 92% now, only half that, less than half that 5,000 years ago. Uh, for the first one, 65% now, so, and only one in six 5,000 years ago. So 5,000 years ago, people in the Ukraine were actually relatively dark-skinned. They weren't as, uh, they weren't as, as uh, dark-skinned as Africans, but they were certainly much darker-skinned than they are today. And so this has happened very, very quickly, indeed, in evolutionary terms. Well, the Scots, I have to say, are the palest people in Britain. Okay, in Europe, rather. Here we see a typical Scot on a wonderful, <coughs> on a wonderful sunny Scottish day. He's obviously feeling a bit overheated here, you can see. Um, and you will notice that he has got, he has got a, a very, very pale skin. Um, there is one particular variant, which is at the highest frequency, higher frequency in Scotland than the west of Ireland than anywhere else in the world, which is red hair. This is the frequency of the variant um, which takes, uh, changes the melanin in your hair to be a different form of melanin and takes dark pigment out of your, out of your skin altogether. Um, and the incidence of red hair is very, very high in Scotland, very high in Ireland, and fairly high in Wales too. In, mo in most of the world, it's unknown. Okay? Red hair is an interesting gene because it makes you very pale skinned and it clearly evolved to allow you to soak up more ultraviolet, um, even though you pay a price in terms of sunburn and skin cancer, uh, but it comes in from an unusual place. It actually comes in from the Neanderthals. I'm sure you, most of you know that actually uh, in about five years ago it was discovered that uh, quite a lot of the European genome DNA um, is actually comes from hybridization with our extinct ancestors, the Neanderthals, who once filled the whole of Europe. And Europe was then much, much colder. We're talking ice ages here. But Europe was much colder than it is today. <clears throat> and if you look at the, 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 pack, pack, the this gene, this, uh, this is one particular chromosome, uh, but you can see patches of red, and there the, the Neanderthal genes 
uh, sections of DNA along that chromosome. There's not, no Neanderthal stuff found in East Asia, no Neanderthal stuff found in Africa. And it transpires that the red-haired gene is on a Neanderthal piece of DNA, so that red-haired people are more Neanderthal than average. I say nothing about the Scots in this context. Um, and here we have Ginger, the Neanderthal, uh, looking hairy. And no doubt the reason that gene was favoured both within the Neanderthals themselves and indeed uh, when they'd hybridised with modern humans was indeed it's, it, 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 it was favoured in a very, very cloudy and unpleasant kind of uh, climate. So that's the, uh, that's the evolved var uh, variation in relation to variation in sunshine. So... As I say, vitamin D is a, is a hormone. It's a hormone which is made, best of all, in bright sunlight on naked skin. And take it from me, both those commodities are rare in Edinburgh. Right. Now, um, so let's, what happens if you don't have enough vitamin D? Well, as you probably know, you get rickets. And rickets was once universally known as the English disease. It was described in the 17th century by an English medical student or an English doctor who uh, submitted a PhD to the University of Leiden. The PhD was five pages long. Oh, my God. As I say about modern PhDs, well, we don't read them, but we sure as hell weigh them. Um, um, <laughs> uh, but his was only five pages long. And he, and, but he, he gave a very precise description of rickets, and uh, he, he said that the people here call it the English disease. And it was the English disease and the Scottish disease because it was much, much rarer in southern Europe. And rickets is a very nasty disease, which was very common remarkably recently. Okay? And the oldest case that we know of rickets is here. It's strangely enough, but not by coincidence, it's in a Scot, a Scottish woman whose bones were found on the island of Tyree in the west of Scotland. And she had a severe case of rickets, um, and that almost certainly is due to a very poor diet. And the, one of the strange things about a lot of island people in Scotland, historically and indeed elsewhere, is that they don't fish. Um, if you eat lots and lots of oily fish, then you're going to be okay. But it's, uh, it's, it seems to be widespread that when farmers get to island communities, make an island community, they farm. They don't fish, and so she had a very poor intake from, from her diet, and of course it was northern and cold, and so she got rickets and without question died of it. That was true of, uh, of many other groups of that page, uh, of, that, of that period too. So the attack on rickets began in, just after the Second World War. Okay? Um, we, uh, we, in the 1930s, rickets was common. Rickets was almost universal among children in inner London. I mean, I now live in Camden, I now, I now live in Camden Town, uh, next door, as I always say, and it is true, next door to Amy Winehouse, um, where she lived uh, rather than lives. Um, and, and Camden was then a slum, even more of a slum than it is now, and it really was a real slum. Um, and it was because uh, Camden Town was close to the railway, there was thick smoke and fog everywhere. Um, uh, even worse than that was Finsbury, the London borough of Finsbury, now full of yuppies and food shops and expensive restaurants. But in Finsbury in the 1930s, more than half the population lived more than two to a room. So the people were sharing rooms all the time. So it was tremendously overcrowded and tremendously poor. And so at least a third of children showed signs of rickets. Well, in the 1940s, um, the war, of course, the war had started in 1939. And in 1942, British, um, British uh, morale really had fallen to a low point. A secret government survey felt that people, people felt we were losing, we might be better off surrendering. Singapore had fallen, Leningrad was under siege, and in North Africa, the British were in retreat. To combat this kind of defeatism, the, the, the government decided to commission a series of posters, in fact there were five of them, um, which uh, showed handsome houses, uh, uh, beautiful countryside, cathedrals, uh, new schools and that kind of stuff, um, and, a, and, a, and a motto, your Britain, fight for it now. I said there were four, uh, I said there were five, you only see four here. And the reason you only see four is this one was censored by Winston Churchill. Uh, where it, um, th this is the Finsbury Health Centre, which is worth seeing. It's the most beautiful building, uh, modernist architecture, uh, which is in, uh, it's in London Borough, what used to be the London Borough of Finsbury, behind the town hall. And it shows this beautiful health 
the center. It just opened in 1938, 1938 it opened. Um, by the Russian architect Lubetkin. And um, behind it is a piece of filthy urban waste um, with a clearly rickety-inflicted child bent uh, and suffering in, in there. And the hope, was, uh, and what he's making the point, that by building these health centers, this is worth fighting for. Uh, Churchill was outraged. This is, a disc this is a disgraceful libel on the conditions prevailing in Great Britain before the war. He didn't believe there was any rickets. Because he'd probably never been to Finsbury in his life. He'd probably never been outside Westminster in his life in London. Um, and, but of course, it was a huge problem. So that was censored. Okay. Um, now, of course, 1945, there was a great upheaval and a new government was brought in. I was actually in, uh, and the NHS was set up in 1947. Okay. And indeed, the Finsbury Health Centre is sometimes seen as the founding uh, gesture of the NHS. Ironically enough, five years ago, the NHS tried to sell it off for luxury flats, um, but uh, there was a tremendous fuss. And it was a beautiful building inside, and it's also quite a remarkable, a beautiful building outside, and also quite a remarkable building inside. Uh, you can see the murals there, uh, the fresh air and sunroom, so you get to live outdoors as much as you can, get as much daylight as you can, which would be very difficult in Finsbury in the days of the smog. And then there was a, a solarium where people could go and have uh, ultraviolet treatment, which would uh, push up their vitamin D levels. And it was a thing with a great effect. And in fact, I, um, I uh, uh, suffered, if that's the word, I experienced exactly that because I was born in 1944 and uh, um, I was, got the full gamut of government-based health advice um, in that I was forced, much against my will, to eat uh, lots and lots of, lots and lots of uh, cod liver oil. I have vivid memories of sitting in front... Oh, there, we, there I am. The funny, the funny thing is there, that's exactly the way I dressed. Um, and I'm sure for many people of my age in this room, that brings back memories. Shorts, black, black, black shoes, and, a, and your jumper. Okay, and here we all are taking our vitamin D. I have vivid memories, uh, Freudian memories perhaps, of sitting naked at the age of five with my young, uh, my female cousins being rather baffled at the... Uh, at the uh, uh, what, what was on view, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, soaking up lots and lots of vitamin D. That was, uh, that was highly effective. This is what happens if you have a child with vitamin D, give it half, half, a, half a dozen hours of uh, ultraviolet, and the, the problem will be solved, so it's powerful stuff. Um, and then, of course, there was the milk, removed by, what was the name, Mrs. Thatcher, a now forgotten politician, um, and, uh, and that too had vitamin D in it as well. And it worked remarkably well. And we know that vitamin that the rickets was, beat, was beaten back. In fact, it was defined in 1954 as having been defeated in Britain. And that was quite remarkable that it got down, it did, was never really defeated, but it certainly got down to very low levels from 30% of what it had been in children in the 1930s. So that was, in a, that was a triumph of socialist planning, but that couldn't be allowed to go on. And really, it was kind of given up. Uh, when the new Conservative government came in, and not much has been done whatever, by governments of any, of any colour since then. But we all know about vitamin D and rickets, but it's become more and more clear that vitamin D is important in all kinds of other uh, parts of the body. As I said, it's a hormone, and if you look at the cells of any part of the body, every single part of the body has got receptor cells onto which this hormone can actually latch. They're in the brain, they're in the heart, they're in the liver, they're in the kidney, they're in the muscles. They're everywhere, okay? And you can see these are just some of the conditions we know are associated with low levels of vitamin D. And this is just a kind of a general statement without figures, um, but you can see that vitamin D is really all pervasive throughout the body, and if you have short, no levels of it, perhaps because you get no sunlight, then you have, uh, you're at danger in many, many different ways. And there was a... A sun cure was already widespread, and the sun cure came from the belief that uh, the sun, for reasons then unknown, could cure tuberculosis. And in fact, R.L. Stevenson, who died of tuberculosis in the 19th century, quite young, 44, I think he was, um, um, he took the sun cure in California, and said, but it was too late for him. The evidence that it cured tuberculosis was then rather weak, but it was known, it, had been, it was discovered, that it discovered it cured another infectious disease called lupus. Okay? Now, lupus, tuberculosis is caused 
by a bacterium um, that's called Mycobacter, Mycobacter tuberculosum. Um, and uh, tuberculosis was once thought to be lots and lots of different diseases. There were things called, there was, there was, there was the king's evil, there was TB itself. Um, there was this thing, lupus vulgaris, which is, but it's the same bacterium, except it's attacking the skin. Okay. And indeed, in 1907, one of the very first Nobel Prizes in Physiology of Medicine was given to a, to a scientist who discovered that ultraviolet lights would cure this, just cure it. It wouldn't just improve it, it would cure it. And in the beginning of the 20th century, something like 2 or 3% of the population were afflicted with this really, uh, really uh, awful disease, which often showed they had TB as well. Um, but T, it, it, this ultraviolet cured it. It cures it because it kills bacteria. Ultraviolet is, as you know, if you sterilize, uh, one of the ways you sterilize um, uh, lamp bottles and the like, and sterilize water when you drink it, is to use ultraviolet light. And it's very, very powerful. Bacteria find it hard to withstand ultraviolet, and so they die. Well, that's gone. However, um, that disease is basically gone. However, there are other infectious conditions. These are the incidence of various respiratory infections, including flu and mainly viral infections, at different times of year in people with different levels of vitamin D in the blood. And that the, the darker the level of the, uh, on, in, in the uh, shading in the histogram here, the, uh, the, the lower level, the lower the level of, of vitamin D they have. And you'll see a striking fit between vitamin D levels and the incidence of respir respiratory infections. Okay. So that too was really fairly unexpected, but it's certainly true. It goes further than that. Um, um, here's cancer. Um, this is the incidence of, of, of colorectal cancer in relation to your vitamin D levels, very low at lower than 25 units, very high at a, more than 100 units, and there's a difference of about 40% in that cancer. True of lots of other cancers, one of the ways in which you can see that that's the case is not by measuring vitamin D levels, although that's actually quite easy to do, but simply asking what is the incidence of particular conditions, cancers included, in different parts of the world in relation to the amount of sunlight that they get. Well, here's the incidence of breast cancer in relation to latitude. And you'll see that breast cancer, Uganda, um, uh, Haiti, uh, Swaziland, Zambia, uh, 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 Mozambique, very, very low in the tropics, the capitals are the far north, Can Canada and Sweden, and the far south, New Zealand and Argentina. Okay? So a really striking effect. That's breast cancer. Um, here's, um, that's, that's breast cancer just shown incidence in relation to latitude. Malaysia near the equator, Iceland near the poles, difference in sunshine. Here's the, the male equivalent, prostate cancer, exactly the same pattern. Okay? We, are, we can go... Um, uh, further than cancer, we can talk about diabetes, type 1 diabetes, which is often thought of being a childhood disease, but it's not. Um, uh, adults uh, sometimes, quite often, comes on in adulthood. We get exactly the same thing if we look down in the tropics, Barbados and so on, uh, Br Brazil, Dominica, Sudan, almost none. Sweden, Aberdeen in the UK, Finland, um, uh, up at 40. Sardinia, rather surprisingly, very high. But down Canterbury, New Zealand, the southern tip of Argentina, exactly the same pattern again. High sunlight, um, low disease for a totally different disease, which is diabetes. Multiple sclerosis, the effect is absolutely striking. Um, here we have the incidence of multiple sclerosis across the world. The, the redder it is, the more there is. It's sometimes described in Canada now as the Canadian disease because Canada has the highest rate of MS in the world. Scotland has a 50% a, a higher rate of multiple sclerosis than England does. Um, it's interesting to look at, at, at Australia, because Australia is kind of, you know, it's fairly sunny. But it, what's, what is interesting is, of course, nearly all Australians, historically, came from Western Europe mainly from Britain, and you'll see when they move to a sunny climate, even though they've got genes that might predispose them to multiple sclerosis, and there certainly are such genes, the sun saves them to some degree, and they get much less MS than they do, um, than people do, in, their ancestors did in their native continent. continent. Um, but you can do more than that. What you can do is you can, uh, what has been done, is in Scandinavia in particular, some very, very large surveys have been carried out on ultraviolet in relation to health, on co co what we call cohorts of women. Women uh, 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 brought into this cohort, they were brought into this cohort when they were 55, and they were followed for 15 years um, and asked 
uh, when they were 55 or older, um, and followed for 15 years, and asked about their, um, about, their, um, about their health. And the hope was to investigate the effects of ultraviolet and skin cancer. And they divided these women into three groups, one group of which um, really liked sunlight, they, they took. They took. Uh, they had went to tanning salons in the winter. They had holidays in the Mar in the Mediterranean during the summer. They went outside a lot. One light was kind of neutral. They just didn't really bother very much. And one group was positively anti-sunlight. They had desk jobs inside. They lived in the far north. They, did, they made no effort at all to get any sun. And they got. There was quite a striking difference in the patterns of 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 survival. Um, the, uh, the, the the you can see that the proportion of people who died when they, of uh, uh, in those who avoided sun exposure was much higher than those who uh, had lots and lots of sun exposure. Uh, whoops, whoops. Um, and uh, the, the biggest effect there were effects both in cancer and both in and in cardiovascular disease and in other diseases too. So the effect is strong. In fact, the thing which is remarkable is that the difference in death rates between high ultraviolet women and low ultraviolet women was greater than the difference in deaths uh, rates of smokers and non-smokers. So that's not a small that's not a small difference. That's a big big difference. Okay. So it's important, I think, then, to uh, you know, be well aware of the importance of ultraviolet light and sunlight, uh, ultraviolet light and health. So what's happening nowadays? Well, I have to tell you, things are not looking particularly good. The incidence of vitamin D from 2000 deficiency in UK children um, has gone up um, in the past 15 years by, um, by 15 times. It's still quite low, but it's going up and going up fast. And British children now... British teenagers now go outside for an hour and a half day, a, less a day than they did only 10 years ago. And that was, of course, 10 years ago they didn't have their mobile phones. Now 70% of British uh, uh, teenagers have got a television in their, room, in their bedroom, and so they just spend more and more time out in, inside. So the proportion of Scottish children who don't go outside is even higher, and across the world only the children of Chile go outside less than British children do. So we stay in. I have vivid memories in my school days of being kicked out of Whittle Grammar School on Liverpool's, Liverpool's left bank of the Whittle Peninsula. Even when it was icy, we were kicked out for a good hour a day. And we thought this was just to allow our teachers to smoke their pipes. But in fact, it was, behind. it was exactly this feeling that you had to be out in the sunlight, which was good for you. So we've moved away from, sun from sunlight. We've moved away from eating oily fish. So understandably, the incidence of vitamin D deficiency is going up. Um, it's, going up much more, it's going up more quickly in, in some groups than others, particularly in, um, particularly, um, in people of Asian and African uh, origin, which means in turn that the incidence in rickets, of rickets is going up. I could only get a diagram for England and look at the red line, which is the, uh, the best set of data. You see it's shooting up. It was, it was almost none um, in, the, in the 1990 or so. It's now going up and going up fast, and it's going up even faster than this. It's gone up much higher than this now. So the effect is real. So we, we, obviously there's a lot of interest in this. And one of the interests is trying to find out how much sunlight people actually get. And I hope you'll excuse me for a moment if I talk about some of my own boring research. I will leap over it. Um, that's, one of, that's a book I hoped, I, I felt, was only half as good as the, as the Double Helix by Watson and Crick. <laughs> but, um, but I hoped it would sell half as many copies, but it didn't. Okay. And that's the snail I worked on for many years. I won't bore you with why I worked on it. Uh, now one of the reasons is that it was highly variable. They, these are genetic variants. And I was interested in the effects of the genetic variation on its behavior. I wanted to know how much time it spent in sunshine, because dark objects soak up more solar energy than light objects do. Okay? And uh, I spent 50, two more than that, 20 years doing this. And we tried to look at the way they behaved um, just by looking at them. And all they ever did was waggle the waggle their, te their tentacles and or fall off a branch or something as exciting as that. So we needed a way to add up the amount of sunlight that people, that these snails uh, experienced over a period of some months. And this is the technique I used. I was walking along a coast, a coastal path in Cornwall, it was, in 1968, the year of miracles, uh, and the, uh, the year after the Abbey Road 
the year after Sergeant Pepper, I should say, rather. Um, and um, and uh, I noticed some, uh, something odd, which is lots of collared wires attached to a board facing south. And I was in the pub that night, and I happened to be talking to a local, and I said, what's all that about? And they said, oh, they wanted to know how much collared wires fade in sunlight. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. I put it in the back of my mind. And then 10 years later, it popped up again. And I thought, just a minute, here's an idea. Why don't we take a dye, or why don't we take something that fades in sunlight and attach it to these snails? And of course, the first thing I thought of in those days, early days of molecular biology was gene manipulation, which involved taking a pair of genes and cutting out squares of denim <laughs> and sticking them onto snail shells, OK, because it was very trendy to wear faded genes. That didn't work, OK. But I did find out what the name of the blue dye in the denim was. It's called Kumasi Blue. I took blue dye, mixed it with a stable yellow paint to make a green paint. Uh, make a green paint. There's the blue and the yellow, make a green. Spotted it onto snails. And you can see the one on the left has spent far fewer hours in the sun than the one on the right, okay, which has faded more. So we had a method of measuring snail shells. Measuring uh, sun, sunlight, um, uh, sunlight uh, exposure, and in fact, I worked for a while in Botswana, and in, in southern Africa, there are lots of quite a lot, and also in West Africa, nobody really knows why. Quite a lot of albinos, people who have no skin pigment, and it is a very, very damaging state for them to be in, because effectively all albinos, unless they take the greatest precautions, um, die of skin cancer at the age of 40. Okay, things are getting better with improved medical care. But I was working in Botswana, and I was talking to a colleague of mine who was a doctor, and he was saying, oh, we have terrible trouble with these children. We tell their parents they must, must not go outside in the sun, they must cover themselves with, uh, with uh, um, sun cream, but the kids just run off, and they don't put the sun cream on, we don't know what to do about it. So another little light came on, I said, here's an idea. Why don't we make them caps um, made, of, uh, made of yellow cloth, and soak that in the, blue, in, in the blue dye, and then when they go outside with their caps on, it'll fade, and we can tell how long they've been in the, they be, tell how long they've been in the sun. And we thought, that's great. And they said, oh, we'll have to check with the ethics committee. I said, what? It's all right, ethics, let, let, so be it. And we went to the ethics committee, and the ethics committee, oh, you can't do that, because you'll be treating them without them knowing. You have to tell them why, they, what, why you're doing it. And of course, we knew only too well that if we told them, the first thing they'd do would be to take their caps off and put them in their pockets so that they didn't fade. So that didn't work. However, since then, there has, and this was 20 years ago we did this, there has developed really quite almost a field of its own that asks how long do people on the average stay, stay in the sun. Um, there are various sensors you can use. There's one, a little plastic called polysulfone, which you can make badges of and pin it on. And uh, if you go out in the sun, then it de this will break down and you can work out how long, um, how long uh, it's, um, uh, those who you're studying have spent in the sun. And the, the work was initially done in Manchester, which is a good place not to have any sun. There's certainly a great, there's certainly very cloudy there. Um, and in Manchester in June, the sun, of course, is at its highest around noon. But even in summer, each of the subjects, and there were hundreds of them who had these things pinned out on, on went out in that, at that time around noon for no more than nine minutes um, on weekdays and no more than 18 minutes at the weekend. So even on the sunniest days, they spend nine minutes a day on Monday to Friday in the sun. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, from, you, you can still make vitamin D from 10 to 10 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, but even that wasn't much better because they, that was 20 minutes in the sun on weekdays and 40 minutes on Saturdays and Sundays. And only one in four had safe levels of vitamin D by the end of the summer, and three in four were deficient at the, by, by the beginning of the next spring. Okay. And many of the younger people had thin bones. They didn't have rickets, but they definitely had thin bones. Things were much worse for people, uh, British citizens of Asian ancestry. Effectively, none of them had safe levels of vitamin D. And effectively, all the women in that group had very unsafe vitamin levels of vitamin D. And many had signs of uh, rickets because, of course, they often cover themselves with, very, with clothes which keep the sun at bay. Well, that's dangerous. Okay. So I think we can have... It, I think we can say quite clearly that actually, here comes the sun, we need more sun. I have to say, I never thought I would do this, but when I started looking into this a couple of years ago, um, I'd never been a great man for, for, for food supplements, apart from red wine, that is. I mean, um, <laughs> um, but, um, but, uh, but I have now, somewhat to my surprise, started taking vitamin D 
um, tablets. And in Scotland, there's been an endless palaver with the government about they're going to give vitamin D tablets to everybody. No, it's too expensive. We're going to give vitamin D tablets to pregnant women, which they're now doing. Uh, in England, they give vitamin D tablets to pregnant women, uh, but only if they're on benefits. They will classic piece of, of Tory meanness there, I have to say, uh, or if they have other children under four. Now, vitamin D tablets cost almost nothing. If you go to Sainsbury's, uh, I forgot how much it costs, but you can buy 200 for about five pounds. So uh, I strongly recommend, and I don't own any Sainsbury's shares, uh, that you actually do that. It's very, very hard to overdose. One of the arguments um, that was used for getting rid of school milk was that people were overdosing on vitamin D. E. That's nonsensical. You'd have to take heroic amounts to overdose, um, and you, you know you really would. You, uh, I take 25 micrograms. Plenty of people take 100. Okay, so that's what. So I really, I really believe what I'm kind of saying. Okay, so um, what's 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 going to happen to the vitamin D problem in the future? It's certainly there, and it's certainly getting wor wor worse worldwide. The World Health Organization has called it an international <coughs> epidemic of frightening proportions. And that's, it's happening everywhere, mainly because people are moving indoors. We no longer have the outdoor life we used to have. The artificial life, light is everywhere. So it's certainly there. But some things perhaps will have, help mitigate the, um, the, uh, the, the effects. Plenty of th things have changed in Edinburgh. Um, well, that's, that's the time people spend outdoors. Um, this is um, a new club in Princess Street, a magnificent early Victorian building. In 1963, it's the year I went to the University of Edinburgh, in late, late 62, and I remember walking up and down Princess Street without really realizing that you were surrounded by some of the finest architecture in Europe. But that was the 1963. Then came the 60s and 70s, and a great improvement was made to the new club. That's the new club in 2017, that vile excrescence. Um, um, and uh, so that's changed. Other things have changed in my life since I went in 1963. That was me when I was a student. <laughs> I still have I still have the moustache somewhere in a in, in in an envelope. I haven't looked at it for some time. Um, I wish I still had the melanin pigment on my hair, but I don't. Um, but I also the weather in Edinburgh has changed. Okay, this is the uh, reduction in the Scottish snow and frost, which reflects um, the amount of sunlight um, um, in. Uh, over, over, over the year, uh, in 40 years from 1970. And you can see a dramatic amount of reduction, 30 days less in lots of Scotland of frost and snow. And that, of course, is part of global warming. Okay. So if that carries on, Scotland will actually get to be, possibly, a rather um, nice place. Okay? Um, in terms of climate, it's a nice place anyway, but uh, in terms of climate. And these are various project projections um, for uh, what might happen the, to the climate of Scotland. Um, the temperature will probably go up between 3 and 5 degrees um, in the next, uh, in, by 2080, okay? Which would be more than the world average because it's starting from a low level. Now, that's going to improve life in Scotland. People, somebody rather well-known, a European, a rather well-known European, so once saw some pictures of Edinburgh in the 1930s. And he came out with a telling phrase, um, there's a picture of a sunny day in 1930s Edinburgh. That picture was seen by a gentleman who's lost to history, uh, Joseph Goebbels. And in 1938, he wrote, Edinburgh will make a delightful summer capital when we invade Britain. Well, uh, they're no longer going to invade Britain, but if they wait long enough, it will indeed make us a delightful summer chemical capital. Thank you. I'll stop there.